this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today I'm gathered here together with my brother in Christ, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update to do the next reading of the wonderful book that Steve Wahlberg provided us with in uh, yeah, some 15, 16 years ago. I think it was 2004, 2006, about the time that he released this book, End Time Delusions. Because Steve Wahlberg, like Tom Fress and me, is sick of the delusion that the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church, together with them, put on the whole earth to deceive the whole earth, to receive another Messiah, but Jesus Christ, and to receive and accept another Antichrist, but the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. We have been speaking about that Antichrist all other parts, our previous parts of this reading. We determined the 1203 score and year day reign of the Antichrist. We saw that there are different understandings of that and, <clears throat> and to which understanding you adhere to. That is something that you have to make out for yourself with your own studies. We are not going back into that. We are just going to finish the last two sentences of that little uh, chapter before we go, uh, that was called What Time Is It, before we go into the next chapter. And who is we? As I said, me, Jörg from Hour of the Truth, and Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, who I'm hard, hard, <laughs> no, I always want to say hardly because that's a German word, <laughs> full heartedly welcome to this broadcast. Hello, Tom. <laughs> Hello, Jörg. Thanks for having me. English and hello to the listeners. Is a yeah. for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my voice will hang together. We'll get this over with. No, Thank we you, should. Jörg. We yeah. sure do, Tom. I will do the reading so you can concentrate on your comments. And uh, that's the way we shared <clears throat> the last broadcast all together. And this is how we're going to do it today. So we are on page 99 in the book of 225 pages. We are on the last page of the chapter that was called What's Time? What Time Is It? And the author says, so what time is it? 
If you check your watch, your computer or cell phone, you can discover the exact minute in, at least for the United States of America, Pacific, Mountain, Central or Eastern time zones. But only the Bible reveals the precise time of Jesus Christ, which was foretold uh, what, 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 what in Daniel chapter 9 for the 490 years and the time, the precise time of the reign of Antichrist of 1203 score years. Now, <laughs> just one thing to add here. It is not because this 1203 score years have been finished in the past, either 1798 or 1866, whatever time frame you adhere to. The Antichrist still rules. Let us make that very, very sure. And I will give Tom the mic in a second that he can elaborate on that before we even go into the very next chapter. There will be people who say, but yeah, but okay, Jesus Christ came at the end of 490 years, or at, better said, at the end of 483 years, to fulfill the 70th week and 490 years completely, 2,000 years ago, and Jesus Christ is since then in heaven, and we don't see him anymore, and Antichrist fulfilled his time of 1,203 square years, so the Antichrist is gone. So, what does that leave us with? No, 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 the Antichrist is not gone. But that uh, 1,203 score years was a prophetic time that was foretold where the Antichrist ruled completely authoritative and solely yeah? the so-called dark ages. But then the light of the world came into the world. Jesus Christ in the form of his book, the Bible, that was forbidden for hundreds of years. And now we have a time where the Antichrist still rules or still reigns, but we also have the word of God so we at least can see who we adhere to. Either man, Antichrist, or Jesus Christ. And I think that's very important to make that little distinction here in the end. Otherwise people will say, okay, the reign of Antichrist is in the past, so we shouldn't care about Antichrist anymore. No, no, no. He is very much alive because the wound that seemed deadly is healed. But I want to give Tom the microphone for a better elaboration on that. Because otherwise, if we don't do that, you maybe have a misunderstanding and we don't want you to misunderstand anything in these absolute historicist-based programs. Please, Tom. Yes, well, along the same lines, uh, Jörg, it's obvious and evident from the scriptures that this man of sin and this son of perdition, this this antichrist, uh, the papacy, uh, will not be destroyed until Christ returns. And he'll be destroyed by the brightness of his coming and by the spirit of his mouth. Okay. So so for anyone who asserts that uh, the 1600 years being, or the 1260 years being concluded, uh, antichrist is no longer a concern, is... Uh, coming up a bit short and so we need to admonish uh, that the Antichrist is essentially if you look at the events in the world uh, and particularly the events and, and the actions of our own government here in the United States I can't speak for Belgium where you're from but I can certainly speak for what's happening in the United States through the government the governments of the world are concertedly and in unison helping to bring the papacy back to global prom uh, global sovereignty. Okay. Uh, you've heard it spoken of by President George H.W. Bush years and years ago, talking about the New World Order, which we firmly understand is not new at all. It's just simply the restoration of the old world order only on a global scale. And, uh, and uh, the government of this country has been set long ago to uh, observe the papacy as its ultimate authority in the world and to extend the papal authority, the, the papal sovereignty and control all over the rest of the world. And that's been the, uh, that's been the predominant uh, effort and uh, preoccupation with our military and with our political uh, caste is to work in unison pol politically and militarily 
to restore papal sovereignty all over the globe. And uh, 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 that's the way you should view the First World War. The First World War, unbeknownst to 99.9% of the people of this country, was literally a papal crusade. And, 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 and so was the Gulf War. As a matter of fact, George W. Bush openly create, uh, uh, claimed it to be a crusade. Now, the bishops of Rome immediately jumped on him and silenced him and said, don't use that word anymore, because that's too, too indicative of what it really is. You're blowing your cover by calling it a crusade. Uh, so the, the Gulf War was, in fact... Uh, a, a a crusade, a Roman Catholic crusade being conducted by the literal battle axe of the Pope, the American military and its allies. And uh, it was intended to bring uh, the de facto government of, of uh, Iraq, Saddam Hussein by name, uh, to bring it down because they'd kicked the Jesuits out of, of, uh, of Iraq. And they had uh, closed the Jesuit bank in uh, Baghdad at the University of Baghdad. And they had, all, they had uh, also threatened to go off of uh, the United States monetary standard, the Federal Reserve note. And we're going to adopt a new currency and compete with, you, with the dollar. And the Vatican and the United States together uh, took them out and replaced them with a de jure government that is one that is sympathetic and subservient to the papacy and to the Jesuits. Now, you're never going to read about that in the, in, the, in, in the newspapers. You're never going to hear about that in the, in, in the, in the uh, uh, government-controlled press. If you can't understand that the Vatican is behind the wars of the world, then you simply don't understand Scripture. Okay? Uh, the papacy rules over the kings of the earth. And consequently, common sense dictates and history confirms that the papacy also rules over the, the militaries of the world. Look, if the king of the United States, we call the president, is wholly subservient to the Vatican, and that is according to the example that we see all throughout the history. All throughout history, if the man of sin in Rome, the vicar of Christ, instructs our president to arm up, and go to war with with the de facto government of, of of Iraq, that's exactly what we do. And if we have to blow up a couple buildings in downtown Manhattan to to uh, motivate the American people to 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 enlist for this crusade, that's what they'll do. And that's what they did. And uh, we were simply waging war for the purpose not of Christ or even for our own liberty. We're waging war for the advancement, the elevation of the papacy's religious and temporal, that is, governmental authority all over the world. That's the very purpose of this country. It has been at least back until the Civil War. So you know what World War I was. It, too, was a Roman crusade. World War II was likewise a Roman Catholic crusade. And who suffered? Protestants, evangelicals. Jews and non-Roman Catholics, and even Roman Catholics, don't let me appear to say that uh, Rome's crusade was so obvious that Catholics were not destroyed. Rome purged her own ranks during those crusades. Rome always purges herself before she goes to war. Liberal and Catholics, a lot, Tom. Yes, liberal Roman Catholics, those uh, who uh, sympathize or our thought to sympathize with Rome's enemies, Protestants, uh, evangelical those, Jews, and those and Catholics, ahead. Tom, who those Catholics, Tom, who appreciate freedom of speech, freedom yeah. of assembly, 
uh -huh. freedom of religion in the yeah. way that they tolerate other religions but the Roman Catholic religion. Okay. Those are called liberals and those must be purged out. That's right. exactly of those. Those are exactly the Roman Catholics that Hitler purged out in his Third Reich. Yeah. Those are always the Catholics that we purged out very first, along mm -hmm. with all the other people who are not in the Roman Catholic realm. It's, yeah. it's very important, I think, for our listeners to understand this, that the Roman Catholic Church doesn't stop at their own doors with the persecution. They even go in there and kill their quote unquote, their own, because mm -hmm. only if you are a Tridentine, absolute Tridentine, ultramontane Roman Catholic, you have any chance of survival in that satanic okay. system. Well, let's define the term for the for the listeners who've never heard it before. Tridentine, huh? Yeah. Yes, Tridentine is, is a term used to describe those who hold strictly to the Council of Trent. Okay, and all the damnations that were announced during the Council of Trent against Protestantism. Okay, the Council of Trent, like I've said before, was a declaration of a, a public a public declaration of all-out war of annihilation against Protestantism, and it announced it listed over a hundred specific damnations, condemnations damned to hell of Protestants who believe certain things. These 100 uh, particular doctrines and teachings of the Protestant churches uh, normally having to do with the false doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church, they damn the Protestants on every count. Okay? So, so, so uh, nobody can argue that it was a plain and open an emphatic determination of an all-out war of annihilation against Protestants. Okay, those who hold to the doctrines of the Council of Trent are the ultramontane, tridentine Catholics, the ultra right wing of the Roman Catholic Church. They're, you might call them the conservatives or the ultra conservatives of the Roman Catholic Church. And don't forget, this is critically important, the Jesuits convened the Council of Trent, they ran the Council of Trent, and they steered the Roman Catholic Church in the way of the Council of Trent from that day forward by leading, orchestrating, and conducting the Counter-Reformation War against the Protestants, and that's their main function in the world today, to keep up the War of Annihilation against the Protestants until they are vanquished. Okay, not one Protestant left alive. And how were they most successful? The teaching of futurism. Remember, Protestantism is built on the truth that Jesus is the Christ and the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. If you believe differently than that, you cannot call yourself a Protestant. Okay, And this is why the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits hate Protestantism with a lethal passion. They will prosecute the war against Protestantism until they are totally vanquished. And that war has been gone on without interruption, without secession, without truce, without uh, 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 diminishment from that time to this. Futurism was their greatest, most successful weapon in the destruction of Protestantism. It literally took the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy and put it on a figment of their demonic imaginations sometime in the future, practically seven years before Christ returns. And this is what's taught now in all the Protestant churches. Okay? It, 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 it's like the papal exterminator put out some poison for Protestants, and just like rats, they came and just ate it all up. That's what we did. Out of ignorance and stupidity, we undermined our own foundation. The foundation being, once again, 
Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. Well, now that we've eaten up the, the futurist poison, we're sick to our guts. We're lethally poisoned. We no longer believe the papacy is the Antichrist, but we believe a single individual, Mr. Wicked, at the end of the end of time, he probably looks a little bit like Joel Osteen. And he's so far off in the future, we don't have to worry about him. Besides that, we're all going to be raptured out before he comes anyway. So let's all go back to sleep. Ta-da! Protestants are dead. Stick a fork in them, they're done. Poke them, they're stiff as a board. Rigor mortis is set in, they're useless, and they're no threat whatsoever any longer to the papacy. So what results from this? The, prod or the papacy has declared unconditional victory over Protestantism. And what Protestants are left have repudiated their own, their own foundation. They've made a laughing stock of their own Protestant Reformation. They are worthless as dogs, and therefore they must come back to the Roman Catholic Church without reservation, and they must restore the papacy to its original power and glory in the world at their own expense, with their own weapons, with their own treasure, and with their own blood and their own guts. And that's what's been happening ever since the Council of Trent. That is what has been happening to God's people ever since the Council of Trent. Ever since the teaching of futurism became taught and believed in the Protestant churches, that conquering of the world for the Pope at our own expense has accelerated exponentially to the, t to the tune of multiple trillions and trillions of dollars, and we've, we've racked up a debt that we can never repay, and this country is in receivership as we speak. Well, the Bible, uh, uh, the Bible says uh, it in Revelation 17 too, the people of the world, uh, of the earth, have been made drunk with the wine of the fornication. Right, uh, and, and we've been and made paupers Protestants, too. Protestants and everybody else are drunk with the wine of that fornication. And when you're drunk, you can't think straight. That means you cannot see the Antichrist for what he is, the Pope you of Rome. Can't, you can't think straight and you can't walk straight. Okay? You can't walk the straight and narrow. You can't go through the narrow gate when you're weaving back and forth with false doctrine, false beliefs, false history, false understanding, idolatry, Roman Catholic doctrine, Roman Catholic teaching, Roman Catholic traditions, Roman Catholic holidays, Roman Catholic government, Roman Catholic mindset. Okay, that is the Protestant churches today. They, none of them, know what Protestantism is, much less demonstrate what a Protestant is. And there's virtually no Protestantism left in this country. I mean, uh, uh, I still continue to find the remnants, small though they be, of remaining Roman leaven in my belief systems that I keep purging out. And God help me to continue to purge out all the Roman lies that I believed as long as I was churched in the Protestant evangelical churches in this country who are not Protestant or evangelical. They are just warmed over Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholicism. They observe the Pope's lying Sabbath they observe Roman Catholic canon law. They allow our government to serve the Pope and w fight his wars for him. And they adopt Roman Catholic canon law into the civil laws of our country and thereby bind us all conscientiously and in physical form to comply with Roman Catholic canon law. We are made to be Roman Catholic against our will, against our knowledge, and we're too stupid to figure it out. Okay? We are so hook, line, and sinker 
uh, in opposition to our original foundation, which again, Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist, with our futures beliefs, we are so counter to our original foundation, there's nothing left to hold us up. And the papacy was so certain of their victory over the Protestant evangelicals, they called Vatican Council II. They convened Vatican Council II to declare victory over Protestantism and evangelicalism and then set a lethal ultimatum to the entire Protestant evangelical world. You either come back to the Roman Catholic Church and accept the temporal and the spiritual power of the Pope and restore him to the original power, glory, and authority that he had before the Protestant Reformation or else. And what does that or else mean? That the government of this country and all of its techno war making technology and power and money and men and materiel will be used against us in our own country, paid for by our own tax dollars. And that is exactly what has happened all throughout history when the papacy declared a crusade against Protestant believers, those who protested the Antichrist. And trust me when I tell you, the Protestant Reformation was not the beginning of that. The Protestant Reformation only marks the Roman Catholics that came to the understanding that the papacy was the Antichrist. Always before, all the way back to the first century, there have been Bible-believing Christians who have declared unequivocally and with their, the cost of their own lives, knowing that they were going to die if they were ever caught teaching this, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. That's why the ground is soaked with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus to this day. When you serve Christ, you renounce Antichrist. And that is what warrants the persecution of the saints. Great tribulation, and it's gone on for nearly 2,000 years. And it'll go on until Christ returns. Those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And if you don't suffer persecution, you're a futurist. Rome's got no reason to, to persecute you. You're just following your nose right down the primrose path back to the Roman Catholic Church. You don't believe the papacy is the Antichrist. You believe a future Antichrist. And you're no threat to Rome. You're no threat to their global agenda. You might even be a threat to yourself if you're a futurist. You're harmless. Okay? They look at you like a dog. You know, we've all heard that the Jews call the Gentiles Goya. Well, that's exactly the way you're viewed by the papacy and by the government of this country. Now, you have to understand, you're never going to hear these things in the mainstream, the alternative, or even the alternative to the alternative media. There's no source of truth in this country, hardly. You're never going to see it in the newspaper. You're never going to see it in a book. You're never going to see it in the, in the press. You're certainly never going to hear a declaration by our government, oh, except until they're ready to perform their extermination of the saints in this country. They love to champion their godly act of exterminating the heretics. And they've always rejoiced over the death, the torture, the dismemberment, the emasculation of the saints of Almighty God. And they wear it like a badge of Christian honor. Those who kill you think they do God's service. And they always boast about their quote-unquote Christian conquests when they kill the saints of the Most High and are drunk with the blood of the saints of the Most High and the martyrs of Jesus. And if you want to know who that is, all you got to do is look at history. 
No question about it. No one can refute it. Rome doesn't even deny it. Rome is proud of it. So for anybody to believe contrary to what we're telling you, they're simply defying common sense and recorded an undisputed history. All right, I've gone on long enough. Maybe we ought to get back to the book, but uh, many of the listeners are hearing for the first time the truth they've never even imagined, much less been hinted at in any source that they've listened to before. But all you got to do is read the scriptures, believe what it says, and then verify it with history. There you have the truth, the inarguable, indisputable truth. And you'll find if you question the right sources, they don't even argue with it. So how can it be wrong? Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I think it was very necessary for you to do this introduction. And when you said uh, something about that they they are proud of uh, the persecution, um, I put in a picture here where you can see a medal that was struck after the St. Bartholomew massacre in 1572 by Pope Gregory the 13th, the pontiff that reigned at that time. They were so proud of killing thousands and thousands of Huguenots, not only in uh, the Bartholomew uh, massacre night itself, but also the coming weeks afterwards, that the Pope held a Te Deum in Rome, which is a very special high mass, and he let struck a coin that you can see here in the picture. And this is taken from a book from Henry Gretton Guinness called The City of the Seven Hills, a book that I can very much advise everybody to get a copy of and read it. And I think it is absolutely necessary, like uh, what, what Tom did in this introduction, to refresh our understanding of the delusion that the Roman Catholic Church sends out in the world to deceive everybody. And they can only do that when they control everybody and everything that is controlling us. So they need control of the media, they need control of the governments, they need control of the military, they need control of the pews, uh, of, the, uh, of the pulpits and the churches, and that's what they have. And one last example before we go into the book is, <clears throat> I can only remember the reign of uh, Ronald Reagan, the American president between 1981 and 1990, if I'm not mistaken. And when he went into office, <clears throat> he was sworn in, facing the obelisk, which was a secret sign among the initiated Jesuits and Roman Catholic hierarchy, that the Protestant churches of the United States of America have all, all been taken over by the Jesuits, and Protestantism is dead in the United States of America. There's no protest anymore. There's only ecumenical sermons in there that do not teach that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, as Tom said. And um, we have to remember that, and we are a very few people who have the biblical understanding, who adhere to the biblical understanding, who adhere to historicism instead of either preterism or futurism, but to historicism, which means that we look to the Bible for the fulfillment of the prophecies, which is history written in advance in the past. And therefore we have to do our diligent own studies because in school books and in most libraries, you will not find any books or records of true history but of falsified history. Because if you knew true history, you all could identify the papacy as the Antichrist, as the Reformers did, as the Huguenots did, as the Albigenses did, as the Waldenses did, as the Lollards did, as the Hussites did, and as so many other people who I cannot name now all through the history from the first century on up to today did. Yerk, one last point, if you'll permit me. Sure. Uh, one of the things I have the most experience with is, is trying to tell people 
the power and authority that, that the papacy exerts over the kings of the earth. The presidents, the kings, the queens, the, the, the princes and the potentates of this world are his vassals today. And, and, of course, people just dismiss that out of hand as conspiracy theorist lunacy. But here's visible proof, undeniable, visible proof. Just go to the Internet and type in papacy and the name or the office of any foreign potentate and go to Google uh, images and see for yourself. There's also another report that comes directly from Rome. I believe it's called Rome Reports. Rome Reports. And it's a video series on YouTube. It's a, it's a YouTube website or a YouTube, uh, what do you call them? A YouTube channel that features the regular reports that come from this Rome Reports business. And in every one of them, they display the virtual meetings between the potentates of the world, kings, queens, princes, potentates, presidents, and every other world leader, uh, uh, even in the secondary branches of the government, coming to the Vatican in black and veils, bowing to the pope, kissing his ring, and going into sequestered private meetings with him. Now listen, this, this would raise the suspicion of anybody with any common sense. And virtually, if you're going to deny that the papacy is exerting his power and authority over the President of the United States, much less any other government authority in this world then you're defying undenied truth. The papacy doesn't deny that it reigns and rules over the kings of the earth. It's only your government that won't tell you this. But you don't need your government to tell you this when the government of the United States has built for Rome a nunciature in Washington, D.C. for the papal representative to reside right in this country. Okay? And also the United States elects or appoints an ambassador to represent the government of the United States to the Vatican. What are they talking about? Okay? If you're, if you're a Protestant, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you've got to ask yourself, if this is a Christian nation, why in the world is our government consulting the man of sin in Rome? And what are they talking about without informing the American people? What purpose do the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church serve in this country? What purpose do the Council of Bishops serve in this country? You think they serve our president? Uh-uh. It's always been the declared purpose of the papacy to appoint his own bishops. They serve the Pope. They do not serve this government. And they are the shadow government in every land where the Roman Catholic Church ex ex uh, exists. Every bishop in every country in, in this entire world are appointed by the, uh, the, the, uh, the primacy of the Pope. They are, uh, it is his jurisdiction, his responsibility, his sole uh, authority to appoint the bishops in every country. They are his vassals. They are his representatives. They are his eyes and ears in every corner of the world, every neighborhood of the world. And they oversee this government. And if this government uh, uh, goes beyond its, uh, its, its, its ruling privilege or defies the authority of the papacy and starts passing laws contrary to Roman Catholic canon law, 
The bishop reports to the archbishop. The archbishop reports to the cardinal. The cardinal reports to the College of Cardinals. And Rome goes into action if she has to use a foreign government to militarily subdue that, that quote-unquote, de facto rebellious government. That's exactly what happens. Now I've just described to you the cause of the wars of the world. And if you'd rather believe the baloney that is reported in the newspapers, be it by all means, go right ahead. But you'll never understand what goes on in this world and what direction they're taking us. You'll remain ignorant for the rest of your life. You'll die ignorant. But if you're wise, you'll believe the scriptures when it says he reigns over the kings of the earth. And the kings of the earth are drunk with the wine of her fornication. And the people of the earth are drunk with the wine of their fornication. The papacy does have that power today. And it's no less the fault of the United States government that the papacy has been restored to its original power. And the only thing good is that it's only going to last for a short time. But as long as the papacy reigns, as long as the vicar of Satan reigns on this earth, God's people are going to be persecuted. That's just the way it is. That's the way it's always been. There's no God is no respecter of persons. He's not going to allow a thousand years of Christians to be persecuted to death, but then treat us differently, as if we've got, uh, you know, God is a is a is a respecter of persons. The scripture says plainly, those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And the reason the the, the Protestant evangelical churches don't suffer religious persecution in this country is because they're hook, line, and sinker servants of the man of sin in Rome. Right along with the government. You believe the futurist delusion. You are nothing but a dog to Rome. But if you repent of that nonsense and you return to the historicist understanding of Bible prophecy, you restore the belief, the teaching, and the practice that the Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. Trust me, you will suffer persecution, won't they, Yerk? Especially, Tom, not only if you say so, but if you live in the way that it is so. When you will call out, and uh, when you c will call out the Antichrist everywhere for what he is, or the papacy for uh, everywhere for what he is, and if you profess Christ before the people, then you will suffer persecution. I think there is no doubt about that, Tom. The and Bible specifically and explicitly, if you obey the commandments as written in Exodus chapter twenty. That is God's law. It's irrefutable. It's immutable. It will never change. It's divine, and it's eternal. God said, I will never change that what comes forth from my lips. And this is where it hits everybody that calls himself a Christian in this country right square between the eyes. There's no way I can remain your friend and tell you the truth about Christianity, which includes every single one of us, including myself. For most of my life, I observed a papal Sabbath, not a biblical Sabbath. And I'm going to leave it right there. Apostasy is unanimous in this country and has been Forever, it seems like. And that's why it seems so many people feel like their 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 prayers can't penetrate the sheetrock on the ceiling. That's why there's no fire in the churches. There's no spirit in the churches. 
there's only apathy and social, you know, uh, social entertainment in the churches. We don't obey God's law. We've committed the same crimes as Israel did all throughout the centuries. We haven't learned anything from the from the mistakes of the Jews, the Hebrews. I, Israel and Judah, we didn't learn a thing from their mistakes. And let us make sure, Tom, it is not only Sabbath. It's every oh, no. quote-unquote holiday. Absolutely. It is Christmas. It is Easter. It is uh, the, um, how do you say, the, the uh, ascendance of Mary and all this stuff, the 15th yeah. of August. How all about how these, about Valentine's Day? Valentine's Day, yeah. yeah. All these all these holidays, they are not biblical. They are not godly. How about they are Halloween? All <laughs> how about Halloween? All Saints Day. All Saints it's just Day. a Protestant word for All Saints Day. Yeah. Halloween is just a Protestantized word for the Roman Catholic All Saints Day. Look, look, look. If you look at this seriously in in a, in a completely repentant and contrary, uh, and 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 uh, uh, contrite heart. There's no holiday that we observe in this country that's not Roman Catholic and unique to the Roman Catholic Church. And we deny every feast that God ever instituted, including His Sabbath. We are totally in rebellion, and and, and you know something else. 20 years of experience talking about these things confirms that you and I, as we continue to speak here, are just talking to ourselves now because all the listeners have left. They've all been convicted. They've all been insulted. They've all been embarrassed beyond their ability to deal with because there's no repentance, no contrite heart. They're steadfastly, stiff-neckedly, committed to continuing these pagan Roman Catholic practices that literally define Christianity. I will put All a cherry of on Christianity. The, I will put a cherry on that cake, Tom. Birthday. Sure. That's Every, another. Everybody observes his quote-unquote birthday, where birthday is mentioned in the Bible three times. Right. It was All mentioned with into- Pharaoh. It was mentioned with Herod, and it right. was mentioned with the children of Job. All yep. heathen adherers, all yep. sun worshippers. There is no birthday celebration in the Bible. Now, right. if, we, if, we, if we don't get the people mad we're speaking about Christmas and Easter and Sabbath, we surely get them mad when we take away their birthday party. Right. That's right. You celebrate your birth par- birthday party. There are three examples in the Bible of such like celebrations. The children of Job. And what happened? A whirlwind came, knocked the corner of the house out, and the whole house came down and killed them all at once. You have the birthday celebration of Herod, where his, do- his stepdaughter danced for him, and they brought in the head of John the Baptist. And you have the example of Pharaoh. And I, you don't even need me to tell you what happened to Pharaoh. Those are the only three birthdays ever mentioned in the Bible. Forget about a birthday of Jesus. That's ridiculous. God literally went out of his way to conceal the date of Christ's birth. You'll not find it anywhere in the scriptures. Never will you find any example of it being celebrated, much less even mentioned in the Bible. The Bible says you are born dead in trespasses and sins. Why in the world would you celebrate the death of a a baby? The birth of a baby is the death of that baby. You're born dead in trespasses and sins. There's nothing to celebrate when another child comes into this country or this world. That child never sees life until he's washed in the blood of the Lamb. If there is a birthday, it's written down in heaven and no man knows it. 
There's nothing to celebrate. Nothing. So where are all of your traditions now? Where is your Christianity now when we take away these traditions? Sure. What's left of your Christianity when you wipe out Sunday, Christmas, Easter, St. Valentine's Day, and all other such like pagan holidays like like uh, All Saints Day or Halloween and your own birthday? What's left? What's left of your Christianity? What will you do now in, in the form of Christian worship? Nothing. There's nothing for you to do. Praise God. Now maybe you'll leave this apostate thing called Christianity and give your life to Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Obey his commandments. That's the whole duty of man, saith the scripture. And if you must celebrate a feast or a holiday, make sure it's a holy day sanctioned by the Lord in the Bible and follow it to the letter or don't observe any. Now we're preaching to an empty room. And that's just the way it's going to go unless there's a global repentance of the saints of Almighty God. Is there any time left to continue in the book, Yerk? Well, our recording is, gone, is done for 50 minutes, so to fill an hour we have 10 minutes. I can start the reading or we can go on discussing the points that we have been discussing already. But um, I, I, I think it's, it, it's good to, even for 10 minutes to go into the book, Tom. I think okay. it's okay. Uh, let me just see, I'll put it up here. Because we have, after we spoke about the Antichrist, what I told you, the 1260 days don't take away the reign of Antichrist because the Bible says in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, that he will be consumed by the coming of our Lord, not earlier than that. That is all the time that the Antichrist is in this world. So when we were speaking about uh, the reign of the 1260 days or 1203 score day year prophecy, and the beast was wounded, now we speak about in chapter 17, the return of that wounded beast. The truly educated man is that rare individual who can separate reality from illusion, says an unknown author. I say, with the words of the Bible in Proverbs chapter 20, 20 verse 1, wine is a mucker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And as Tom and I made the point already in our introduction, Revelation chapter 17 verse 2 says that the people of the world are drunk with the wine of the fornication. And if you are drunk with the wine of the fornication of the kings of the earth who have committed fornication with the whore of Babylon, you are not wise. This is what Proverbs also speaks about. Now the Bible warns about the beast, quote, his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast, unquote. You have to understand the Bible says all the world wandered after the beast, not a part of it, leaving out America. No, America is not left out. Also America wanders after the beast. Now, I have to prepare a picture here of the indwelling. Let me just see that I didn't prepare that picture yet. So. In dwell, I got the picture preserved here. This is the book that we want to see, or the cover that we want to see, because this is what we are talking about now. This is a book by. Tim oh, by the way, and before we even start. We are not promoting this book. 
Okay. But this one, the indwelling. No, 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 no. Yeah. Okay. No, no, okay. absolutely not. I'm just showing it because the author mentioned this here. Yes. He says near the end of the book, the indwelling, the beast takes possession. Book seven of the Left Behind novel, and we know Tom, the whole Left Behind novels. This is something all our listeners know now too. Is the futurist uh, marketing of or propaganda? That's right. Straight from the, the pit. Delusion. Straight from the pit. Yeah. And this is a book number seven of this whole novel. The Antichrist, who is called in this book Nikolai Carpathia, is assassinated in Jerusalem. His corpse is jetted to Babylon and a funeral service takes place before millions of viewers with the full media coverage. As the world's television cameras are fixed on the coffin, the unbelievable occurs. Carpathia's left index finger moves. His chest starts to swell. His eyes open. Nikolai finally stands up and triumphantly declares before an awestruck world, quote, Peace be unto you, unquote. In the Left Behind next book, The Mark, The Beast Rules the World, His Excellency Global Community Potentate Nikolai Carpathia is back, this time as Satan. Resurrected and indwelled by the devil himself, it's no more Mr. Nice Guy as the beast tightens his grip as ruler of the world. Can you imagine, Tom, like this little uh, white spot that says on the cover of the book, over 40 million sold in this series? Yep, 40 this million of these deceitfully these deceitful lies have been bought and enriched Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins to multi-millionaires and they have in return deceived a whole world of Christians 40 million yep really getting deep and this is only about the books we are not speaking about how many people watched the movies they made of that. Yep. Okay? But that's the media controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. Now the author continues to say, this is how many Christians imagine Revelation 13 verse 3 might be fulfilled. This is the imagination. What's the reality? Yeah, now, see, remember, if you're a futurist, you have to speculate. You have nothing concrete to go upon. Okay? You have nothing of this futurist scenario to point to in history as the unmistakable fulfillment. Or in Scripture. That's right. You don't have the support of Scripture. You don't have the support of history. You don't have support of even common sense. All you have is vain imagination. Vain imagination. That's right. Carefully devised fables, fables. the Bible calls it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This little review of a murdered and resurrected Mr. Sin has been depicted in scores of prophecy books and was graphically illustrated in the multi-million dollar Christian film The Omega Code. <laughs> I wouldn't call it a Christian film, but let's leave it for that. You can have your own thoughts about that. Although details vary, most modern portrayals involve the Antichrist being shot with a gun and then miraculously being raised to life. When Ronald Reagan survived a gunshot wound during his presidency, some speculated that he might be the Antichrist whose deadly wound was healed. As always, there's a big difference between fact and fiction. The wounding of the beast is referred to four times in Revelation. We'll read that in chapter 13 and verses 3, 10, 12, and 14. Yet, notice, the beast was wounded by the sword and lift. Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. By the sword... Thus, his wound comes from the sword, not a pistol, rifle, or sub, uh, submachine gun. 
Revelation 13.10 also reveals the additional insight that the wounding of the beast involves his going into captivity. Now we have to understand, of course, the book of Revelation is a spiritual book. It a spiritual needs, book. It needs to be understood spiritually. A sword in the spiritual sense is not a sword in the material sense, but the sword is the word of God. That's why Paul declared the sword of the Spirit to be the word of God itself when we read Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. During Reformation times it was this that wounded the papacy. As John Wycliffe, John Huss, William Tyndale, Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, John Calvin, John Wesley and countless other spirit-filled reformers wielded the Bible's message about Jesus Christ and Antichrist, Papal Rome received a nearly fatal slash. Hundreds of thousands left the Roman Church and Europe was shaken as with a mighty earthquake. The final blow against the weakened Roman system came in 1798 or 1866, we spoke about that, so watch the parts we discussed this in, when the army of Napoleon invaded the Vatican and took the Pope into exile, or in 1866 when Garibaldi took away the Papal States, which led to the captivity of the Pope in 1870 within the Vatican, as we spoke on other broadcasts about. We are not going back into that discussion again. God's prophetic clock had set the year 1798 as the end of the papal supremacy and when the hour struck, the mighty ruler on the Tiber, before whose anathemas the kings and emperors of Europe had so long trembled, went, quote, into captivity, unquote, as we read in Revelation chapter 13 verse 10, and his government in the papal states was abolished. Okay. Now, what we need to focus on is this is real, concrete, documented, and indisputable history. The fulfillment of Bible prophecy. If Bible prophecy is never witnessed in history to be fulfilled, then it's either not yet fulfilled or it's a false prophecy. All right? No prophet of God prophesies falsely, and we always find fulfillment, perfect and complete fulfillment of the prophecies of God in history. It's the only place you'll find the, his, uh, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy is in history. Now... I'll, 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 you know, digress just a little. Remember, so far we've been talking about the prophecy of Daniel's. Daniel's 70 weeks, and particularly the 70th and final week of that prophecy, is recorded in history. The most important, the most accurate, the most divinely authored infallible history book that we have is the Bible. Whatever it says is true. And the New Testament, word for word, not once, not twice, but even three and four times confirms the very language that Daniel used in describing the prince that shall come, and what he said and what he did, as recorded in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. And the whole prophecy business of the Christian church now is not on concrete, divine, infallible history. It's on speculation. Ridiculous speculation. Childish speculation. 
as you can witness for yourself by reading these stupid books by LaHaye. Defies scripture, defies history, defies common sense, and it's laughable. Absolutely laughable. And anyone who's ever read and believed those malarkey books ought to be ashamed. But don't let it seem like I'm looking down my long nose at everyone that's listening today. I'm no better than any of you. I've made the same mistakes you've made. I believe the same futurist lies that you have believed all your life. There is not one thing that I have that I wouldn't impart to you if it were in my power. Full repentance of futurism. Full repudiation of the apostate Christianity that exists in this world today. But not because I'm better, but because I've been mercifully saved from it by a merciful God who loves me. Back to you, Yerk. Well, Tom, I read it. And I'm going to end this video with the same statement again. All the world was deceived by the beast, Revelation says. That's and right. Tom just made the point. He was deceived. I was deceived. And most of you are out there where, I even dare to say, everybody of you was deceived at one or another time in this life. And some are still deceived. And those who are still deceived, we urge you to pick up the Bible, read the Bible, and pick up these videos, this video series, pick up the book from Steve Wahlberg, read that book, follow the reading, even though we didn't read much today, during these videos, follow the reading, have the book next to your screen, read in the book, follow our reading, follow the Bible afterwards, and see that also you come out of that deception, because the Bible says, all the world wandered after the beast. All the world was deceived. But there are few people that God takes out of that dis delusion. And those are the people that he calls out to in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, when he says, Come out of her, my people, that you do be not partakers of her sins and that you do not receive of her plagues, because God has remembered her iniquities. You come out of it when God calls you. Then you, for the first time, hear the voice of the real and the only shepherd that you need to follow. And he will lead you to the straight, narrow path. And he is the door that you go through to come to him who says of himself that he is the life, the truth, And the way that you have been walked on, Jesus Christ. There is no other salvation given unto man on earth but by the man Jesus Christ to be saved. Everything else is a delusion. Tom was deluded, I was deluded, and you were deluded. You're not deluded anymore. You came out of it. Now it is time for you to take up the sword, meaning the Bible, and to shout it from the rooftops that the papacy is the Antichrist and that Jesus is the Christ and that you will not be a partaker of any of the Antichrist satanic agenda in this world. That you will live a life now that is filled with the Spirit, that leads, that is led by the Spirit, and that you will tell people the truth about everything that you know that you've studied in the Bible and you've studied in real history. Because if you keep it for yourself, you put the lamp under a bed. And nobody does that. When you have light, you want to show it. Be a light in this world. Be a light for Jesus Christ's word. Show his word in this world and get other people out of the deception. Why? 
because you're a Christian. And being a Christian means you adhere to the commandments of Jesus Christ, who narrowed ten commandments down to two. Didn't take anything away from the ten, but narrowed it down to two. The first commandment is love your Father who is in heaven with all your power, might and soul. And the second commandment is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. And if you love your neighbor, you tell him the truth. And the truth is only to be found in the Bible. And Tom and my work here is to help you find the truth and to proclaim it to the world. And then we're going to see you, hopefully, next time with another part of the series of the End Time Delusion book reading. Until then, read your Bible. Maranatha. The President DeJoyer's invitation started me thinking about the many similarities between Jesuits and News Corporation. Uh, both, both the Jesuits and News Corporation attract highly talented people from all over the globe. Both the Jesuits and News Corporation like to challenge the status quo. And both the Jesuits and News Corporation have a reputation for independence and innovation. Of course, there are some differences. I don't want to discourage anyone who might be considering the priesthood. Uh, but I will tell you that at News Corporation, we don't insist on vows of poverty or chastity. Um, and as chief executive, I can tell you that I'm sometimes not sure about the degree of obedience either. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. DUP leader Ian Paisley was jostled, punched and then dragged out of the European Parliament today after interrupting a speech by the Pope. The disturbance came within seconds of the Pope starting to speak. Other Euro MPs responded angrily when Dr. Paisley heckled the Pope, saying he was the Antichrist. Permit me to say how much I... I call you to order and I ask you to stop this disturbance. For the second time, Mr. Paisley. For the second time, Mr. Paisley, I call you to order and I ask you to respect the dignity of this house. Mr. Paisley, I now exclude you from this house and for the remainder of the city. Mr. Paisley claims he was punched and that he later received a personal apology from the head of security for failing to protect him. The poster stated simply, John Paul II Antichrist, a reference to the view supported by Archbishop Cranmer in Reformation times that by claiming to be God's earthly representative, popes have usurped the position of Christ. He remained unrepentant despite being accused of being a bigot. But let me say this, if the honor of Christ is at stake, I would put my whole political career on the line for the honor of Jesus Christ in this group. I happen to be a Protestant by conviction, and I'm not going to sell my Protestant heritage.